Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Welcome. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he is not going anywhere as Prime Minister, despite a revolt from a number of his MPs. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev lashes out at the Prime Minister following Ottawa's announcement that immigration numbers will be slashed. And we hear from a researcher at Lethbridge Polytechnic who discusses the dangers of social media and how addictive it really can become. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Justin Trudeau says he will remain on as Prime Minister despite a caucus revolt. His comments come after a group of two dozen Liberal MPs asked Trudeau to step aside in a letter presented to him on Wednesday. It asked for him to let the caucus know by October 28th what his decision would be. Now Trudeau says he has no intention of stepping down as Liberal Party leader by next week. We're going to continue to have great conversations about what is the best way to take on Pierre Polyev in the next election. But that'll happen with me as leader going into the next election. Yeah, later Trudeau and a number of his MPs insist that the party is in fact united right now. The Liberal Party is strong and united. We have a very open and frank discussion uh, and people are relentlessly focused on, on serving Canadians and win the next election. So this was really a rallying call to win the next election. Are you the Prime Minister has a support of his caucus? A full support of his caucus? But really the wisest thing for us to do is to go through what you call a working through process. Spoken well over 50, I'm sure. Yeah. And they came at this from all angles, and now we've got to go back and process this. We are on a good path. The Prime Minister says a slash to immigration targets and previously announced measures are making our immigration system work a little bit better. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced next year's new permanent resident target, which will be 395,000. It will then drop to 380,000 in 2026 and 365,000 in the year 2027. Now, previously, the target had been 500,000 next year and in 2026. It doesn't mean we've left these people behind. Uh, we are prepared to institute a smaller program in number to make sure that we are targeting important aspects of the economy, whether it's construction or healthcare, to regularize some folks that, again, should be Canadian uh, by right and aren't today. Now, the change comes following criticism of the Liberal government's increase to immigration and the impact of strong population growth on housing availability and affordability. Federal Tory leader Pierre Polyev says today's change in immigration policy shows that the Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Today's immigration flip-flop is a massive admission of failure by Justin Trudeau, an admission that he's not worth the cost or the corruption. With his own MPs working to throw him out, and less than a year from the carbon tax election, Trudeau has suddenly admitted that radical, uncontrolled immigration and policies related to it are partly to blame for joblessness, housing and health care crises. In fact, let's remember, after nine years of Trudeau, we have one in ten Torontonians lined up at food banks. We have 1,400 homeless encampments across the province of Ontario. Two million Canadians have to go to a food bank every month. Scurvy is making a comeback. We have the worst economy in the G7. Everything is broken. Federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, meanwhile, took to the mic to warn Canadians about Conservatives. Singh says supporting Pierre Polyev means that you're supporting cuts. He wants to cut people's pensions. He wants to cut health care. He wants you to have to spend money out of pocket to get the care you need. He wants to cut from people to give to rich CEOs. And what that means is people get less and they end up paying more. And we're seeing that again and again. So if you're watching what's going on right now with the Liberals and it's making you feel cynical, if you're watching the Liberals right now and you're losing hope, don't. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. You can join us. New Democrats have shown that we can fight back and we can win. The federal government's efforts to match donations for humanitarian needs in Lebanon is still a million dollars short of its goal with about 10 days to go. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie is attending a conference in Paris on the situation in Lebanon, with most of the focus falling on the need for emergency relief. Host France says the conference raised about a billion dollars in pledges. 
Global Affairs Canada says Ottawa has allocated just under $50 million to Lebanon this year in humanitarian aid. The United States, meanwhile, will be providing a further $135 million in aid to the Palestinian people. Speaking to reporters in Doha, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says it's critical that help reaches Gaza right now. Water, sanitation, maternal health for Palestinians in Gaza, in the West Bank, as well as in the region. Uh, and I would note that since October 7th of last year, our humanitarian assistance by the United States uh, now totals more than $1.2 billion. As Israel conducts operations to remove the threat to Israel and its people along the border uh, with Lebanon, we have been very clear that this cannot lead, should not lead to a protracted campaign, and that Israel must take the necessary steps to avoid civilian casualties and not endanger UN peacekeepers or the Lebanese armed forces. Another Hezbollah terrorist has been eliminated. According to TBN Israel's Yair Pinto, Hezbollah's designated successor was taken out following recent strikes by the Israel Defense Forces in Lebanon. The IDF confirmed on Tuesday that Safi el-Din, the successor of Hezbollah's chief Hassan Nasrallah, has also been eliminated in an airstrike in the Dachia neighborhood of Beirut three weeks ago. The Air Force is continuing to strike Dachia, and a Hezbollah official who was in the process of issuing threats against Israel's leadership had his press conference interrupted by another airstrike. Meanwhile, in a targeted airstrike, 18 Hamas terrorists were eliminated in the Gaza Strip, and there are also signs of a breakdown of Hamas in Jabalia. Some terrorists tried to escape by pretending to be civilians, but they were caught and arrested. Meanwhile, it can now be confirmed that last Saturday's Hezbollah's drone attack resulted in a direct hit to the private residence of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Elsewhere, Iran is increasing its threats and Israel is responding with emergency preparations. Well, here in southwestern Alberta, it was nice to get back up to double-digit temperatures once again. Jeanette Roche is now with an early peek at the forecast. Jeanette, if we think it's decent weather now, wait until the weekend. Yes, weekend's looking mighty lovely. Uh, back up to the teen temperatures then, but uh, not tomorrow. Friday, we are heading back down to the single digits again. Lots of sunshine, though, and also not as much wind. Only a 15 kilometer per hour wind tomorrow. Uh, that'll be a nice reprieve from what we saw today with the 60K winds uh, lasting into this evening. Uh, by overnight, though, those should die down quite nicely as we get into Friday. And I'll be back later in the show to give you a full look Look at the next week weather-wise. Hal? Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Police in Montreal say two suspects have been arrested following a stabbing altercation near John F. Kennedy High School on Thursday. Officials say one of the injured teenagers is out of danger and officers are waiting on the conditions of the other victims along with their ages. Police say the incident took place in an alleyway in front of the high school when a group of four males approached the teenagers and attacked them. Three of the people who were stabbed were sent to hospital while the fourth was treated on scene. Two of the teenagers taken to hospital have since been arrested as suspects. The school was put on lockdown, but it has since been lifted. The Manitoba government says progress is being made in the search of a landfill for the remains of two First Nations women, Morgan Harris and Mercedes Myron. Jeremy Skibicki was convicted of first-degree murder and given a life sentence for killing Harris, Myron, and two other Indigenous women back in 2022. We're currently standing on a pad that will be the search facility proper. And you see these large interlocking uh, bricks on the outside. They'll form the foundation of a steel, film, steel frame that's going to be uh, stood up right where we're standing. Significantly, late last week, we began to move material in, above the cells of where we believe uh, Morgan and Mercedes are. So behind us today, where we're currently gathered, you can see an excavator and you can see rock trucks that have begun to lift off the top layers of material so that we can get into the target area where we believe the remains of these uh, two women that we love so much and have devoted so much time thinking about uh, are. British Columbia's Green Party leader, Sonia Furstenau, says she's spoken to NDP leader David Eby since Saturday's inconclusive election result. She also refused to take a call from B.C. Conservative leader John Rustad. 
Firsta now says she will wait for the final election results before talking about the Greens potentially helping in a minority government. Uh, I have not yet spoken with John Rustad. I have concerns about statements his candidates have made and positions his party has taken on many issues, including climate change. My focus right now is on supporting our two MLAs and engaging in meaningful conversations about how the people of BC can be best served. Uh, until the final vote count is in, I'm focused on the two MLAs. Federal government officials say they've spoken with the government of Alberta about funding to tackling tent encampments and homelessness here in our province. Federal Housing Minister Sean Fraser says he chatted with Alberta Social Services Minister Jason Nixon a day after Fraser said Alberta had not responded to an offer of funding. Officials say Nixon expressed his government's willingness to partner with Ottawa to cost match the extra federal funding. The money would go to address the issue in Lethbridge, Calgary, Red Deer and Edmonton. Officials are directed to meet in the coming days to negotiate a deal to see funding go to these communities immediately when finalized. The town of Coaldale is looking into a pilot project with the province that would allow golf carts to run on certain municipal roads in the town. An announcement took place Thursday morning at the Lander Lakes Golf and Country Club, showcased by local MLA Grant Hunter and Coaldale Mayor Jack Ben Ryan. Hunter says the bylaw is a common sense approach in dealing with the use of golf carts in the community. The Lander Lakes Golf Club surrounds residential streets in the town, which previously was allowed to run golf carts until 2022 due to non-compliance with Alberta traffic safety laws. On June 14, 2024, Alberta's government began working with municipalities to establish pilot projects to allow golf carts on municipal roads. This change will provide Albertans with additional mobility and recreational options as well. To date, six communities comprising of the county of Lacombe, the village of Linden, the summer village of Whispering Hills, the town of Delburn, the village of Acme and Half Moon Bay have applied for and been approved to use golf carts in their communities. Coaldale was waiting for the announcement to apply uh, before they applied. The first step is that we have to incorporate new bylaws. Once we uh, uh, figure out what area we're going to be doing this, and then once we get the bylaw in place, then we can do the application to the province. And I feel extremely confident that we can have this all in place for spring. Alberta would be the fourth province to introduce provisions to allow golf carts on municipal roads. The pilot project is expected to last for about five years. The 2024 Poppy Campaign launches this Friday in Lethbridge. The initiative, which honours those who lost their lives battling for Canada, runs through till Remembrance Day. Glenn Miller, co-chair with the General Stewart Branch 4 at Royal Canadian Legion, discusses how poppies can be acquired. The Governor General and the Lieutenant Governors of each province have received their official poppy from the Royal Canadian Legion. And on Friday, our volunteers will be starting to deliver poppy boxes to a variety of different businesses in different routes. At that time, people can start uh, picking up the poppies and wearing them. And I would encourage the public to wear them from the time you see a poppy right up through till Remembrance Day, not just on Remembrance Day. Stopping to think about veterans and those who actually um, paid with their lives. And that's why we wear a poppy today. In the poppy boxes, there's uh, also electronic ways to make a donation. Uh, poppies are always free. Uh, donations are gratefully accepted. Uh, if some of the people who have bought support our troop vanity plates, although they're not veterans, it's saying thank you to a veteran. And Miller adds a poppy flag racing ceremony will take place at Lethbridge City Hall November the 4th at 11 a.m. You know, for many, the digital age has brought some great challenges. And one of them is knowing how to balance the time we spend in front of our screens and not necessarily when we're working in front of a computer. For some experts, there are many reasons that cause concern about remaining exposed to screens longer than the recommended period of time, and that includes sometimes becoming addicted. Lethbridge Polytechnic instructor and researcher Dr. Simon Chairs explains. You know, excessive times on screen time, and especially social media, is, is addictive. Right, it's addictive. So you've got these sort of drop, dopamine-driven feedback loops, especially built in almost intentionally into, into social media platforms that are intended to keep you on. When you're on screens, you're not doing other things, right? Especially if you're starting to look at exceeding two hours, three hours a day, uh, that's valuable time that could be spent doing other things, like for one, being physically active, which we know uh, kids and teens are not getting enough of. 
And then just uh, face-to-face uh, interactions, right? So there's this concern amongst experts that uh, digital uh, interactions are replacing uh, the uh, the physical face-to-face interactions, these direct and indirect uh, effects, I guess, of, uh, of extensive exposure to screen times kind of comes to, to a head with increases in, in anxiety and, uh, and depression rates amongst especially kids and teens, which certainly to me are, are quite worrying. According to Stats Canada, 94.5% of Canadians who used the internet back in 2022 spent between 10 to 20 hours a week on their digital devices. That excludes time watching stream video content or playing video games. Well, we enjoy lots of sunshine again today across much of southwestern Alberta, and that trend should continue as we make our way to the weekend. A full look at the weather picture is coming up. Not a lot of leaves left on my maple tree in the backyard thanks to that legendary Lethbridge wind. Jeanette Rocher is in now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, any more wind in the forecast? Shall I kiss the rest of the leaves goodbye? Well, there might still be some hope for the beautiful longevity of those lovely, colorful leaves, uh, especially as we're looking at those winds dying down quite a bit tonight. So we're going to see the winds die from 60K down to 40, down to 15, down to 10 kilometers per hour by Friday. It's hardly even a breeze, hardly worth mentioning. So all that to say that, yeah, we could still see some leaves for the weekend and what a beautiful weekend it is about to be. So we're seeing that nine degree day on Friday, but then we're jumping back up to the high teens for Saturday and Sunday, highs of 17 and 18 respectively, and then back to the single digits Monday, Tuesday, 9 degrees and 8 degrees, uh, rounding out that seven-day forecast with 10 degrees on Wednesday, so mostly staying in the seasonal range except the weekend. So average high for this time of year, 11. Average low, minus 2. 25 was our record-breaking day. That was the high temperature uh, back in 19, uh, rather 2007. In 1919, uh, we were looking at the record cold of, of minus 23. Sun rose this morning at 8.09, 6.21. That's when the sun's going to bed. And we're seeing four minutes more daylight than we did yesterday. Okay, so tomorrow, Victoria looking at increasing clouds in the morning. 12 degrees for a high, 11 for the high in Vancouver tomorrow. Also increasing clouds in the morning. We have sunshine across most of Alberta tomorrow. 7 degrees for the high in Edmonton. Calgary seeing a high of 6 degrees. Could see some wind chill in the morning in both of those cities. Same thing with our uh, main Saskatchewan cities here. Saskatoon 9, Regina 10. Seeing some wind chill in the minuses in the morning. Clear skies though. Nice sunny day in, in Winnipeg as well expected tomorrow with that high of 10 degrees. As we look to Toronto, we're seeing a 40% chance of showers there. High of 14 degrees, 11 for the high in Ottawa. Seeing a sun sunny and then sun and cloud by the afternoon. And then we're also seeing increasing clouds throughout later the later part of the day in Montreal with a high of 12 degrees. As we get into the Maritimes, we're seeing a lot of rain in some of these parts, except for Fredericton there. We're seeing mainly clear skies there, high of 12 degrees. Halifax, so we're seeing a 60% chance of showers, 11 for the high. Charlottetown, nine degrees for the high, looking at a 30% chance of showers. Also very windy conditions there, up to 70 kilometer per hour winds. St. John's, here's what's happening. We've got a rainfall warning in effect. Uh, we're going to be seeing up to 30 millimeters of rain and could see up to 70 millimeters more tomorrow. High of 16, though, and 60K winds. So there you have it. That's your forecast. Movie chain Cineplex is appealing the record $38.9 million fine for deceptive marketing practices imposed on it by the Competition Tribunal. The company filed notice with a federal court of appeal denying it engaged in drip pricing and asking for a stay of the fine pending completion of the case. Cineplex was accused of misleading theater goers by not presenting them with the full price of a movie ticket when seats were purchased online. The company began charging a $1.50 online booking fee in 2022 to many customers not enrolled in its Cine Club subscription and Scene Plus loyalty programs, which saw the fee waived or dropped. Equifax is launching a program to allow newcomers to transfer their Ford credit history to Canada. The credit reporting company says its global consumer credit file will make things easier for immigrants to access services like loans and cell phone plans here in Canada. The launch comes as Nova Credit has been expanding with a similar offer as Canada continues to see elevated immigration levels. Equifax says its program will initially apply to newcomers from India with plans to expand 
to Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. Now here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 22 basis points of the day to 24,551. The Dow was also down 140 points to 42,374. The S&P 500 was up 12 points to 5,809. And the Nasdaq was also up 138 points to 18,415. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 42 cents to $70.35 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was up 18 cents to $2.51 U.S. Gold was up 14.39 to $2,735.72 U.S. an ounce, and silver was down 15 cents to 33.67 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $8.25 per bushel. Barley is at 6.12. Canola is $14.45, and corn is $7.37 per bushel. Live cattle were up $1.65 to $189.30. Feeder cattle was up $0.82 cents to $2.49.40. And Lean Hawk's December contract went down $1.52 and sits at $78.65. And the Canadian dollar was even over the past 24 hours and currently sits at $72.20 US. Recapping one of our top stories, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he will remain on as Prime Minister despite a caucus revolt. His comments come after a group of two dozen Liberal MPs asked Trudeau to step down in a letter presented to him on Wednesday. It asked for him to let the caucus know by October the 28th what his decision would be. Trudeau says he has no intention of stepping down as Liberal Party leader by next week. With so much turmoil in the world today, where is God in all of this? Is it important to look at world events from a biblical perspective? Alistair Petrie with Partnership Ministry says yes, and we'll have more details for us momentarily. Listen, when you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. Current events taking place around the world are stirring up fear and concern among so many. Economic uncertainty, wars, terrorism, and propaganda, and political instability, including right here in Canada. So what is God saying and doing through all of this? Joining us today to chit-chat a bit about it from Vancouver Island is Dr. Alistair Petrie. He's the Executive Director of Partnership Ministries, host of the Petrie Perspective podcast, say that quickly three times, and author of God's Footprint on the Land. Alistair, welcome back to BCM. Thank you very much, Hal. Great to be with you. You bet. Now, for viewers who don't know, tell us a bit about Partnership Ministries and what it's all about. It evolved probably about 30 years ago, coming out of my own background in parish work and previous to that when I was a broadcaster. Always loving to ask the right questions the right way and seek the answers to what really is going on. So it's a ministry that talks about transformation of people, cities, nations. We research that. We communicate that. We teach the principles. We used to do a lot of physical travel, more it's working with researchers around the world. And our aim, our desire is to promote the good news in spite of the bad news, because God is at work today in profound ways that secular news never actually refers to. So our work is transformation of people, cities, businesses, nations, and teaching the principles. And that's what our books, that one book, um, God's Footprint in the Land, is part of a series of business, you know, how do you get God's footprint in your business? How do you do prayer templates? Uh, well, at other books, like the, the Fear of the Lord and Signs of the Times, we've written on all of that. And much of the earlier writings are now really coming to pass today in a time such as this. So these hell are phenomenal times in which for us to be living, not negative times, in spite of what we might see. You know, you're right there. I mean, there's so much going on in the world right now, including the wars in Ukraine, Gaza, and Lebanon. We have the big U.S. election just around the corner. The outcome could certainly affect things like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the sanctity of life, and, of course, the economy. Your thoughts? Well, this is all part of the Haggai 2 and Hebrews 12, shaking of structures and systems. God's always done that at cyclical times in biblical and human history. We are seeing phenomenal things taking place before our very eyes. 
when the, the exhibition of evil is being personified through people, nations, politics, structures, systems, ethics, morals. And look at this hell. We've got it in Canada. We've got a divided province here in BC. We've got an interesting situation in New Brunswick. We've got a potentially really divided United States. We've got massive angst all across Western Europe, particularly in the UK. This is a sign of the times. People are jolly well angry. There are spiritual influences behind it. There are human interests behind it because people have not focused on the Lord. They've focused on the negativity. And that creates the human angst that so often is that which promotes people's thinking into ways that create wars and hostility and division. Wars and rumors of wars, as God talks about in his word. Now, there are some people who believe that there are powers at work behind the scenes and some would refer to this as the deep state. Now, is this mainly conspiracy theories or are those with, who are actually out there with negative spiritual agendas opposing God's kingdom? Well, I'm going to give you what I call a non-Anglican answer by my background. I'm not going to sit in the fence, but I will say sometimes there is truth in conspiracy, but it's partial truth that's personified and magnified incorrectly. It's based on a partial truth and it's based on Part, partial perspective on what is going on today. Now, look, this is not you. It's all across Daniel chapters 8, 9, 10. Ephesians 4 talks about it. Ephesians 6 talks about it. The key thing, Hal, is that we have a healthy biblical worldview that understands the spirit realm and the physical realm. Putting it very simply, what we see going on around us physically is actually only a partial perspective of what's going on spiritually. God is spirit. We are created in his image. There are spiritual issues at work. Yes, there are negative and there are dark. But let me say, there are so many profound things going on globally that the secular news does not talk about. This is also exhibiting the power of God at this moment of history. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Not, conspirat not conspiratorial thinking, but conspiratorial thinking is looking at the negative, what's going on behind the scenes. Partly true, because the enemy does work with people. But let's also look, focus on the truth and the light of Christ. That's my point there. Now, Alistair, according to the polls, it certainly does appear quite likely that we'll see a shift in government here in Canada. Is there a spiritual connection to this? I mean, do you have a sense of what kind of changes we may see over the next year or two? Well, first of all, it is, it is part of the Daniel 2 uh, perspective that God is shaking also political systems. Each political system that becomes satisfied with itself needs a jolly good shaking once in a while. I believe there's going to be a significant change. I'm always concerned in any nation, Western nation, when there's a marginalizing of Christianity, which we do have now. We didn't have that quite to this extent years ago. I would say the signs of the times which we study carefully as a ministry, are all pointing to a major shift here in Canada. But this is not a time also for us to blend our eyes to the reality. People often say, well, what's the point of voting? Look, there's a lot of points in voting. We, we understand what 1 Timothy 2 says, how we're supposed to be voting for those in authority. We don't pray at the negatives of the political party. We're called by the Lord, Luke 8, Hebrews 4. We're called to pray into light what is darkness so that people can see for their own eyes the reality of what's going on. So that's my perspective on Canada. Yes, I think there will be changes, necessary changes, but it has to be for the purpose of administrating the kingdom of God in these latter days. Let's talk about some of the changes taking place in Europe. We've seen some serious shifts taking place in elections in places like France, the UK, and Germany. We're seeing clashes between the far right and the far left with some surprising results at times. Alistair, it appears as though these groups have a very different view of the world. What are some of the spiritual connections taking place in Europe? Whenever you're in a time of war, of course, you are going to have so many issues taking place that wouldn't be part of our normal life. Now, I happen to do regular live streaming. That's one of our works that we do in the ministry with 16 nations across Eastern Europe. I am working 100% with all the main leaders on the front line. Russia, Belarus, Russia, uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, working into Israel, working into Norway, 
working into Germany. I'm, I, I tell you what, we're getting frontline information all the time. The point is that these people, sometimes they're killed. I mean, sometimes I don't see them again. War is war. This is real flesh and blood stuff. But they are aware of the principalities and powers. I'm right now teaching them on the subject of intercession, how to pray into an issue and not at an issue. Yes, I think there's going to be an increase in war because of the anger, the angst, hidden agendas of the rogue nations, the BRICS nations. These are all the quid pro quo issues, Hal, that are coming out into the open in these days. Hidden agendas are being revealed. So both Western and Eastern Europe are actually, I would say, receiving now the reality of those hidden agendas. And there are spiritual issues, anti-Semitism, uh, pro-Palestinianism, and people don't understand even the background to Palestine. So they're, they're fighting wars for which they really don't have valid information. But yes, Israel is the thermometer and the barometer in prophetic and physical human history. So we're seeing now more than just wars and rumors of wars, and this is now spreading into other parts of the world, particularly into Europe, government systems, ethical, moral systems, uh, all issues of what we call civilian history, but it's spreading into every area of life right now. Let's talk about the war in Ukraine for just a moment here, Alistair. How is God really moving in the midst of all of that chaos? Well, first of all, what you're seeing on the regular news is only a part of the story. Let me tell you, they're having incredible revivals. I'm working with some of those people. Many people in both sides, Ukrainians and Russians, are coming to Christ. They're having reconciliation ministries mm -hmm. behind the scenes. They're praying for their leaders, Zelensky and Putin. They're praying that the light of Christ shines in the eyes of their leaders. So you don't get that part of the news. That's what I'm getting at. So there are actual major areas of reconciliation and healing in the midst of war and bloodshed. That is all, that's all part of, unfortunately, the collateral damage that we have in warfare. We've always seen that in human history, but we ask the Lord to minimize that. They are praying over there how to be presence carriers. They are praying how to be light bearers. They are praying how to be changers of the spiritual and physical atmosphere. And they are praying for their nations for how to focus on Jesus, not in the darkness. Hell, that's what I'm getting from 16 nations that right now are in persecution, and right now they're experiencing many elements of what we would call revival. Why are we not seeing more revival in Canada, in our country here? I mean, I keep hearing about countries in Africa sending missionaries from there to here to tell us about Jesus, Christ and his gift of salvation and his love. You really want my perspective on that? Yeah, let's hear it. Because we're awfully nice. Because we don't really, as Canadians, search out the real truth of what's going on behind the States. Yes, we're influenced from the States. We're influenced by what we hear our government doing with China and India and those issues. But culturally, we don't really understand the culture of the kingdom of God. That's what I teach in our podcast. That's what I'm teaching in our news updates. We have to be people who understand the nature of the culture of the kingdom of God, not a myriad of many cultures that just have to get along with each other. It's the culture of the kingdom of God. It's understanding Psalm 24, who we really are as citizens of the kingdom of God, recipients of the benefits of the kingdom of God. So what's happening here in Canada is we're awfully nice and we don't want to really speak negatively against each other, but we have to recognize there's a language and there's a strategy of the kingdom of God that God requires of us as a nation. Yes, historically, nation of reconciliation, nation of healing, but we're also a nation where cultures come in, and part of our call is to introduce them to Christ. And we're sometimes a little pacifistic about doing that. And that's why we need to ask the Lord for his strategy of how we pray for each other, how we pray for the cultures, and certainly how we pray for Canada to be that that catalyst of change nation, which God has called us to be. Alistair, let's talk about what's happening in the Middle East. I mean, Israel's at war with Hamas in Gaza and the Gaza Strip, and now with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, Israel's at war with, with many, and a lot of the proxy wars being funded by Iran, of course. Now, some believe the prophecy is in the process of being fulfilled through all of this. How do you see it? 
I believe it is being fulfilled. I'm not sure if I agree with all the different levels of eschatology that people refer to when you look at Matthew 24 and the signs of the times. I do think 2 Timothy 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, the time of apostasy is certainly here. But when you marry this together and you look at Israel, look at the dynamic of that little nation. I mean, gosh, historically, geographically, culturally, strategically, to be able to take out weaponry, iPads, uh, information equipment, to be able to seek out leaders of Hamas, Hezbollah, other such areas. There are stratagems there that go beyond human understanding how. That's always been Israel, right back from the get-go. We do a lot of teaching on the remnant church these days because I believe Canada has to rise up into its uh, into its destiny and into its integrity. Well, that's what Israel is doing. And you're going to see quid pro quo pact agreements coming out more and more with nations like probably North Korea and China and Russia and Syria. But you're also seeing, um, I believe, a time in which all the nations are being called to the table. This is really, really key. What is our attitude towards Israel is going to be the levying factor for the way we stand before the Lord. Not everybody understands Israel. Not everybody's done the history and the study of Israel, but it is a people of God that's a template. It's a template into what God is saying to all other nations at a time like this. So yes, I think we're going to see maybe a little times of peace, but it's going to escalate more and more because it is a nation God is using to deliver notification to the rest of the world in a time such as this. So how should we as believers be responding to all of this conflict around the world right now? Well, I believe, first of all, we are to be praying with insight and understanding. I'm, one of my favorite sayings is praying sight on sight. Well, I can't physically travel all to all these nations, but I can through Zoom and I can through live streaming. Number one, Many Christians I know, great leaders, never listen to the news because they feel it frames what they believe. And I say, look, you've got to listen to the news to understand what's going on globally. Then you ask the Lord how to pray into it. Frame yourself with Scripture. Frame yourself with correct prophecy. Frame yourself, surround yourself with colleagues who pray with you. In other words, start, start to pray the emphasis of the kingdom of God. You know, in just many scriptures, such as Proverbs 21, where it talks about the king's hand being in the heart of the Lord. If that's true, let's pray that. Let's pray 1 Timothy 2. Let's pray how we pray for those in leadership. And don't just, don't just be overwhelmed by the negativity of what's going on. Understand that this world does belong to the Lord, and he is serving notice in such a time as this. So let's not create a stumbling block for the Lord. Let's become a catalyst of shift by understanding the times, but noting what the Lord has said to us. By the way, one of my favorite sayings is you get into Matthew 26, learn how to keep watch. Because in Matthew 25, yeah, there were five brilliant bridegrooms ready with their wick and their all. There were five asleep. Actually, they were all asleep when the Lord returned. It was the messengers who had to waken them all up. I want us to be messengers for a time such as this, as we understand the times, as we focus on what the Lord is saying, understand Romans 13, we're all subject to the governing authorities. But that doesn't mean we agree with them. It means the Lord's giving us the authority, almost the audacity, but certainly the tenacity to pray with understanding and insight for a time such as this. Amen and amen. Dr. Alistair Petrie is the Executive Director of Partnership Ministries and author of God's Footprint on the Land, available at partnershipministries.org. Alistair, thanks for joining us today from beautiful Vancouver Island. Great to be with you. Bless you all. Thank you. You know, to many of us, prayer is a very important part of our lives, a straight line of communication with our Heavenly Father drawing us near to Him. It's also wonderful when God hears and answers many of our prayer requests. There are some, however, who wonder where, whether prayer not actually works. Joining us today to talk a bit about this is Pastor Mitchell Meiselar and Leah Switzer. Uh, Mitchell is the family pastor at One Life Church, and Leah is part of the Lethbridge House of Prayer. Great to have you join us here on Bridge City News. Thanks for having us, Hal. <laughs> now, 
when you talk about prayer gatherings, what kinds of things should we really be praying about? Maybe during turbulent times and the war is going on right now, a lot of the political unrest, should that maybe be a focus? Mitchell, what are your thoughts? Definitely. I, I think I think all too often we think about these things and then that's the first thought that comes to our mind is, okay, we're going to pray for the civil unrest, we're going to pray for political stuff, all of those kinds of things are normally the first things that come to our mind because in times like this, prayer normally gives us hope in those situations. It's like you said, that that doorway, that direct communication from our Heavenly Father that kind of gives us that hope. Um, but I think in all honesty, we need to turn a little bit more in prayer, more than just the turmoil situations, but also in our day-to-day -day lives as well. So Leia, for you specifically, how important is prayer? I mean, yeah, it draws us closer to God, but like Mitchell says, gives us some hope. But what else does prayer really offer? Well, for me personally, prayer is my lifeblood. That is, that is where I exist. Scripture tells us to pray unceasingly. And it's for that reason that it brings us closer to relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is through that relationship that we begin to see things move, things change in family, in the world around us. Um, we, we know that we, when we pray, we, we are, we don't, we don't pray um, our, let me put it this way. We're in a kind of warfare in, in prayer because we uh, don't battle against flesh and blood. We know that. We battle in the spiritual realm. And there are many things that we can change as children of Almighty God because he has given us authority to do so. So prayer for me is an absolute must consistent. Um, it, is, it is what feeds my soul. It is what keeps me in tune with the Lord. And it's what gives me joy. And joy is my strength. So that's where I'm at with prayer. You know, many people say that peace gives, a, I mean, prayer gives us peace, keeps us well grounded. But Leo, what do you think we should be praying about specifically when it comes to Lethbridge? Well, you can see the results of the um, of the things in the natural that that are ungodly, that are harmful, that are hurtful. We see addictions. We see um, child prostitution. <laughs> we see child trafficking. We see um, all kinds of things in the natural, which is a reflection of the spiritual. And I think. Those are the kinds of things that we have to pray for. <laughs> now, I'm saying pray for, you know what I mean by that. We're, we have to look at that by um, asking the Lord to intervene in those situations. But also, we're called to pray for people in positions of authority, influence. And so we have to pray for the people in municipal government, provincial government, federal government, because it is through that, through prayer, that I believe we can release God's purposes in government. And so there's, you know, there's multiple things. So you can pray for your family. There are situational things where um, a child, uh, let's say you have an older child that needs a job. And so you pray for those things and ask the Lord to open doors for you, uh, for them and to and to bring about, you know, to slam shut doors that the Lord doesn't want them to go through and open up doors where, where they should go. So, I mean, there, all you have to do is step outside your house and you can see what things need to be prayed for. <laughs> so, Mitchell, do you have any examples of how prayers really brought, brought about a huge change to a nation or even to a city like here in Lethbridge? I was thinking a lot about this. And... and the funny thing is, there are so many different examples in regards to this. Um, I, I was thinking about um, in the, I think it was like in the 1850s, there was a change that happened in New York City um, where a, a small prayer gathering, where it started out with one guy, turned into six people. Within a month, it was 10,000 businessmen 
who were praying and meeting together and everything else like that. And they, they changed the, the city of New York and brought about revival in a time that there was no hope because at that point in time, every, all the businesses and stuff were shutting down. There was market collapse and everything else like that. And these people prayed and it changed not only people's lives, but also the city's lives just in general too. So there is, I mean, you look through all of scripture how many times when people have prayed uh you look at daniel you look at david you look at you look at all of these people in scripture that prayed first and then change started to happen in regards to the nation's lives and the areas that they're around in cities and all those kinds of things prayer has a bigger at impact i think than sometimes we even realize I, you know what i'd like to bring up you're talking about asking about nations if you take a look at Salvador and you look at the president, President Ortez from Salvador, he, he, Salvador was a country that had the highest crime rate, the highest gang murder rate in the world. When President Ortez became president, he instituted prayer with the people in positions of authority in his government. It is now one of the safest countries in the world. And he credits that. He, when you talk to him, I saw an interview with him. And when, when he was talking, he said, I can give you the earthly or the natural response for why this has happened. You know, we have programs here and programs there, and we've done all these different things. However, if you want the real reason, it's because of prayer. So how can we actually bring how can we bring prayer, though, Leah, into the House of Commons in Ottawa when so many of the MPs are of different faiths? We see Sikh, Hindu, Muslim. Should we allow them to say their prayers then specifically as well? Because we're, you and I, we're talking about our Heavenly Father Christ-centered prayers, right? So how would that work? Well, I think we have to recognize, we have to go back in history. Canada was founded on the rule of law and the dominion of God. And so... Although there are people that do not follow that faith system or do not have that faith in their lives, I think we need to go back to our original intent. It is written on our parliament buildings that God, that God will have dominion mm -hmm. over Canada. And we need to go back to the foundations of that. Um, I don't know whether... Um, there are, there are multiples of people of different faiths that, um, that are voted in or that become members of parliament. But I think we need to focus as a country on what our calling is, and our calling is a Christian nation. And so I think we need to stand on that. Mitchell, let me ask you something. Speaking of prayer, how about bringing prayer back into schools? Do you think that'll make much of a difference with our youth and the, our future generation? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it was one of the biggest mistakes that this country ever made was taking prayer out of schools and not allowing them to participate and not allowing these groups um, to make changes in regards to this. Um, I know of a couple of youth that have started Bible studies and stuff in their schools and it's public schools and the pushback that they received in regards to it it hurts a lot from my perspective um, as not only as a pastor, but as, as one who has kids myself. Um, I want to see these things happening in the school systems where people of faith, of Christian faith, can get together with no pushback, no issues, and be supported in regards to things. And these groups that are starting in these public schools are making changes. They are leading young people to Christ, and it is amazing to see the changes and stuff that are happening in these young people's lives. If we could bring back prayer to school, I think we would see a multitude of changes where identity would become so much more important than what it is right now, where they would be comfortable with who God created them to be, not what the world is telling them to be. So first priority, please bring the prayer back into schools. Let's circle back to political leaders for just a moment. You guys touched on that earlier. The Bible does, in fact, instruct us to pray for our political leaders. Now, when you speak one-on-one -on -one with some of our political leaders here in Canada, are they offended or bothered that people are actually praying for them? Or do they even welcome this? Leah? 
They absolutely welcome it. And it actually shocks them that anyone would be praying for them. And I, I think there's an underlying recognition that um, faith moves the world. And that when people care enough about you to pray for you, to keep you in prayer, to, to ask the Lord to bless you, to, to give you wisdom, insight, and discernment, that is a, a valuable and a wonderful thing because it shows the love of God. And I think that's what really touches people's hearts. What would you guys consider a healthy prayer life? Is it you, first thing when you get up in the morning, you praise God, you thank Him, you ask for wisdom and discernment, maybe when you're praying over your lunch and then at dinner time and before you go to bed, or just like constant prayer throughout the day? What are your thoughts? I think it has to be that constant thing. I think, I think like you brought it up already about the fact that we are to pray without ceasing. Our whole lives need to be a reflection of prayer. Yes, it's great to start your day off with those prayer things of thanking God that you made it through the night, that he's given you a new day, and then asking God for wisdom and direction for just your day. But I think it's more than that. It's about turning your whole day over to God and praying through the entire day. We often think that we have to bow our heads, close our eyes, fold our hands, and, and that's prayer. But our, our prayer is more than that. It is, it is our actions. It's our thoughts. It's our attitudes. It's how we carry ourselves through our day-to-day -day activities and asking God those questions. Okay, what should I be doing in this moment right now? Do you have anybody who I need to be speaking to at this moment in time? And it's not asking God, should I take left or should I go right? Sometimes those are our questions we need to answer ourselves, but it's about those little moments where I'm sitting at a lunch table and somebody's sitting by themselves. God, do you want me to go and speak to them and share your gospel message with them? That's that prayer without ceasing. It's that constant communication with our Heavenly Father. You know, and I remember a pastor many years ago told me, Hal, when you do come to our Heavenly Father in prayer, come to God with reverence, acknowledging His presence, acknowledging how powerful and loving, and just showing that respect to our Heavenly Father instead of just, you know, bowing your heads, closing your eyes, and, and you know, putting your hands together in prayer and say, God, I need this, 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 this. That, that's not really how it works. That's too one-sided. That doesn't really develop your relationship with our Heavenly Father. Leah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it, it all boils down to attitude and motivation. I, I, and, and prayer for me is conversation. I mean, that's, it is relationship with Jesus Christ. And so um, we, I think, have lost... Um, over the years in in the faith community, our awe and reverence for God and for his holiness. But that becomes something that you can request from the Lord to instill in your life. When we ask for the mind of Christ, when we ask for, um, for a pure heart, those kinds of things, which then develop your relationship in reverential awe of the Lord. But I, I really, I really think. I mean, we've been given a, a re prayer is not a difficult thing. He just wants to talk to us, and we, we should just want to talk to him because I mean, he, he is a wonderful, wonderful not only lawgiver, but he is kind and he's gentle and. His, his, his ways are so above ours. And so I, I you know, when, when Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, that's a very simple method of doing the right prayer process. Now, you have a very special 40-hour prayer and worship event that you have coming up next week at One Life Church on uh, the 31st. Tell our viewers a bit about it. We are really excited about this. Um, I know it's being hosted here at One Life Church, but this is a multi-denominational, multi-church event. Currently, right now, we have eight or nine different churches that are involved in the prayer aspect and worship aspect and everything else like that. We wanted to make sure that this was about the Church of Lethbridge, not just one church. So we are doing 40 hours straight of prayer and worship. We'll be going back and forth between prayer and worship. Some of the hours we have, I think like a six hour time slot where it's nothing but 
worship where there is like a four hour slot of just prayer time. So we want to invite the entire city to come out and join us in this 40 hours of prayer and worship. And I think it's really important to know that that the the intent here is to build up the family of God mm -hmm. and to and to bring oneness, wholeness, um, unity. And so as as an ecclesia, which is the family of God, we believe we believe very, very strongly that there must come a bringing together of the family of God so that people can begin to see and experience the Lord in their lives, whether they've had any kind of relationship with him or knowledge of him before at all. But it's really important. And that's why when, when Mitch was talking about um, a number of churches coming together, that's the key. The key is to bring the family of God together in one accord. Mitchell Mizelar is the family pastor at One Life Church, and Leah Switzer is with the Lethbridge House of Prayer. Thank you both so much for joining us today on Bridge City News. Thank you. Thanks so much. Lovely talking to you. Thanks so much, Hal. Appreciate it. <laughs> and behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless. Thanks so much for watching.